Hi, this is Guy Wallace with another edition in my video series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, with your host, me, Guy Wallace. Note, I've also subtitled this series, The Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. Today we're going to take a look at performance modeling, which has two parts. First, there's the areas of performance, a chunking of the overall performance, whether that's for a job or a process or an entire department. Um, it's just one way to segment the scope of work that you're going to be analyzing so that you can do deeper analysis on all of it and not miss anything and not overlap anything. So the first part, again, is areas of performance, and that leads to us creating performance model charts for each of the areas of performance. Now back to areas of performance. They're also known as uh, major duties, accomplishments, key results areas, many different names for this same kind of a concept. Bucketing. Bucketing the uh, work. I like to take a process orientation so most of my areas of performance have a task sound to them, not a topic sound. Um, and once you've segmented of that performance from end to end, the goal, the acid test is, does everything that the performer does fall within one of those areas of performance, one of those buckets, one of those boxes? Uh, Addy is an example of areas of performance. There's analysis, which is different than design, which is different than development, which is different than implementation, which is different than evaluation. Those five buckets, if you will, segregate, segment the world of work for an instructional designer. They may have other duties, other areas of performance that are part of their job, but that's going to be one of the core parts of it, or some model or equivalent uh, of that. Uh, and then we can look at each one of those areas, we can look at what are the outputs produced and what are the key measures. In other words, how do we know a good output from a bad one? And that reflects the stakeholder requirements because the stakeholders have requirements for an output of a process. Now, some stakeholders may also have requirements for how the process or the tasks are performed to produce that output. But that's what we're basically looking for, outputs and their key measures. Then we're interested in all the tasks per output not just task analysis where we've just gathered or listed a whole bunch of tasks. These are tasks organized by the outputs that they're intended to produce. So begin with the end in mind. What's the output? How do you measure one? What are the task performs? And then also we can add some role responsibility clarity by identifying who's really responsible task by task for the performance to produce that worthy output within that area of performance. Anyway, so as we walk through the performance model chart for an area of performance, we gather that ideal performance. What in the current state is going on? Now, I like to assemble a team of master performers minimally. Perhaps it also would include other subject matter experts, supervisors, and office performers. But bottom line, you want master performers to articulate, no kidding, this is what is produced. This is, these are the outputs produced. These are the tasks. Now, one thing that we know from the research is that uh, master performers, experts, or really anybody, we're all operating on non-conscious knowledge. And if we were asked to identify, to delineate all of the tasks that a novice would need to perform, the research shows us that an expert will miss up to 70% of that, and that's a lot. So how do you contend with the fact that even if they try, your experts, your master performers or your subject matter experts can't give you everything? Well, you go through a process where you're gathering the data, reviewing it with that person that gave it to you, prodding them, prompting them to for any holes that they might be able to backfill, and you're doing the same thing with other reviewers. Um, what the research shows is that while experts can miss up to 70%, the 30% that they know is different, one expert to the next. So if you deal with enough of the experts, you'll get closer to perfection. You probably won't ever get perfection 100% of what the novice needs, but you'll gather everything that you can and then go to pilot test that later on to backfill any of the gaps that we're still missing. Um, 
But anyway, so that's what the performance model does. It's the heart of my approach to instructional design and to performance improvement beyond knowledge and skills. The performance model captures the ideal performance of the current state or a future state level of performance that is desirable, feasible, doable, not something that's blue sky impossible to, for everybody to attain. But so if people, master performers, are currently operating at that higher level, what is it they produced? How do they go about producing it? And then when you get to the other side, the right-hand side of the performance model chart, that's where the gap analysis comes in. That's where we look back way over on the far left hand side of the chart and look at the measures for the outputs and we normally start off with saying for this particular output and this particular measure is there a problem for the people who aren't master performers in meeting that or do the non master performers also beat that so we're using that as a way to figure out so the people that aren't master performers where are they struggling and let's just not talk about you know why they're struggling or what the struggle kind of is no what output does it affect and what measure is at risk because mass master performers can do these things can produce these but non master performers struggle so where are the struggles we begin with the measures of the outputs and if there are struggles with that we list that over there in the typical performance gap not atypical, not once every three blue moons, but something that's kind of all going, uh, ongoing all the time. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify what are these gaps that people struggle with? What are the probable causes for those gaps? And we list those. And then we identify whether those probable gap causes are a deficiency of the environment the environment is not providing everything that the performer needs and therefore that's why that output and the measure is missing the mark or is it a deficiency of the person's individual's knowledge and skill they just don't know they've not been trained or is it a deficiency of some other individual attribute or value is it their physical limitations their psychological limitations their intellectual limitations or the fact that their personal values aren't conducive to the job assignment so we're trying to understand those gaps. Now, we need to understand gaps in performance, the typical gaps, because we need to tap into the master performers and determine what are their strategies and tactics for avoiding barriers in the first place and what to do if those barriers were unavoidable. So what strategies and tactics do the master performers have to avoid things in the first place or if it was unavoidable, what do they do now? And if we can capture that and we can also then teach that to the novice performers, the people that aren't master performers, the new hires or incumbent populations, and teach them basically the best practices, the good practices of the master performers so that they too can avoid barriers, anticipate them and avoid them, or what to do if unavoidable to minimize the damage that they might cause. So that's what performance modeling is. It allows us then to systematically derive all of the enablers for performance. So what are the knowledge and skill enablers for us, those of us in the instructional design world? We want to know that. But we also need to understand what are some of the other enablers in the process if that's part of our assignment. Um, if there's gaps, we want to flag those, as we said, so that management can go fix those in some parallel effort. Or if they're just not fixable, if it's not feasible for them to make a fix to an environmental issue, then how do you deal with it? How do you best deal with it? And theoretically, if your master performers are dealing with it successfully and are performing at a level of mastery, can we get more people to perform at those higher levels or approaching those higher levels? And what would the return on that investment be? Anyway, this is Guy Wallace with another episode in Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development, subtitled The Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. Thank you. Cheers.